All right. <clears throat> first things first. Let's um, go over the test. So let me open that. Leave it unplugged for five minutes. Plug it back in. All right, I'll get to it when I'm done. Sorry. All right, so we covered all this. Okay, so we've covered red blood cells. We've covered white blood cells. And now we are talking about platelets slash coagulation or, or clots. So um, I don't need that slide. Okay, so this is a platelet plug formed by platelets. And I think I made this more difficult than it really needs to be by, by writing on it. But, um, okay, so you got tons of platelets, hundreds of thousands of platelets per uh, microliter of uh, blood. And usually when something... Um, when you have some kind of intrinsic or extrinsic damage, when you have some kind of um, damage, um, like like here's the endothelial cells of the of your blood vessel, right? And it's like, you know, like if um, something were to run into, I don't know if you ever see like cement, like a cement foundation, and when the cement wears away, you could see like the metal rebar inside. That's kind of, for our body, that would be like that metal rebar, those metal bars, that would be like collagen, right? And so the collagen is getting exposed, and that's kind of a signal to all these platelets. And so you notice here that these platelets are like round. And you notice on the second photo that they've started to make – they're shaped differently, right? They're more elongated, and they're they're – they're um, more shaped like a square. I don't know what to say, not like a square, but they're making projections, right? So what they do is that those, uh, those collagen fibers are going to activate platelets, and those platelets start acting different. So they change their shape. That's number one. And then number two, they secrete a few different chemicals. And so the first chemical is ADP, which you might remember from that – um, ATP is ADP plus P, that thing, right? So it's the same ADP. So adenosine diphosphate or ADP. ADP is going to activate the other platelets nearby. So that's one chemical that is secreted by these platelets, ADP. And thromboxane A2. I didn't write it out. I put THA2, but TH stands for thromboxane. So throm remember that word thrombo meaning... Uh, platelets, thromboxane A2, that is also going to attract uh, platelets. And then, so there's two, two chemicals, ADP and thromboxane A2, they attract the platelets nearby. And ADP, I'm sorry, thromboxane A2 and serotonin, I'm I have it written down here, Serotonin and thromboxane A2 act as vasoconstrictors. So they constrict the blood vessel before the damage, right? Because you want to slow the, the flow of blood because you don't want it leaking out, right? So like, let's say if we're looking at the top, the blood's flowing from like left to right. So it'll, the vasoconstriction will be before the opening to slow the blood flow this way. So ADP makes the other platelets sticky. Thromboxin A2 makes the other platelets sticky and it's a vasoconstrictor. Serotonin is a vasoconstrictor. You might have heard of serotonin being a lot of other things and it is. It's all those things but it's also in this case it's also a vasoconstrictor. So that's going to make all the platelets start to stick together and plug up the hole. That's what this bottom photo is. I don't care so much about me personally, like on a test, I wouldn't care about platelet adhesion, platelet release reaction. I don't care. I'd really like you to know what the chemicals are and um, 
and and the fact that um they're going to change their the platelets be, change their behavior so that's a platelet plug it's kind of um you got three ways your body has three ways to slow down or to stop um <clears throat> to stop blood from stop you from bleeding <clears throat> the first way which i didn't even talk about and i'm not even going to test you on it it's called a vascular spasm and that's just simply your um your blood vessels those that have muscle your blood vessels uh contract and stop the flow of blood for example um some people that like if they lose an arm, like if it's like a clean break, like straight across, um, I don't know why I'm doing it that way. But if it's straight across, what will happen is that like the blood vessels, um, like your arteries, they'll um, constrict and actually retract up in your arm. And it's not like on the movies where like blood's spurting out. Um, it's There's not a whole, I mean, there is blood loss, but not like a lot. It's really rather minor. It's a little less than you would expect. Um, if it gets like torn off or something, yeah, I mean, it does. But when it gets cut off like straight, it's the, and that's like a, an example of a vascular spasm. So the, the muscles just contract inside your blood vessels and it, that, that can stop a lot of um, blood loss. Um, if you have small cuts, like a finger prick or something like, or, or if you get, if you're bleeding for any reason, then you just stop right? Band-Aid. That's platelets, right? But then you have bigger things. And so bigger things are going to need um, clotting. So, um, so these are like your red blood vessel, blood cells, and here's like these threads that make a clot. And so what clots are, is they're like a bunch of threads that make a web. And this web's going to catch like um, just everything. This web, this net is gonna is going to trap platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells, and it just makes a big mass, like an embolus, right? It makes a big mass of of stuff that's and that makes a clot, right? That's for more that's for more serious things. I'm just making sure everyone's still here. Okay. Yeah, that's for more serious matters, right? So you've got a, 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 so I kind of look at it this way and I might not be exactly right, but like um, a platelet plug is just for like normal cuts that resolve themselves, right? But for big serious wounds, then you're going to, you're going to do a, um, your body's going to make a clot. So um, I should have made you learn the tissue factors, but I already have it marked up. So I'm just going to leave it like it is, but there are different tissue factors that you're you, you actually will learn about them. I don't know why I um, took them out, but whatever they're out. And so here you see on the top, it says extrinsic and intrinsic. And all that means is where did you get your trauma from the outside? So like getting cut, that would be an extrinsic or external right so extrinsic pathway and then intrinsic pathway means that the damage came from the inside um at the end of it all you'll see for example something called factor 10 and anyway you ha you have an enzyme here so at the end of it no matter how it happens it starts off with this enzyme called prothrombinase so when you're about to, when you're going to go make a clot the first step is to make the enzyme prothrombinase that's right here so like i'm slowing down so that you take note of it um so prothrombinase prothrombinase is an enzyme how do i know it's an enzyme well it ends with ase so that's a dead giveaway um so prothrombinase is going to convert something that you have in your blood called prothrombin going to convert it to thrombin so you see the differences between these words here's thrombin here's prothrombin pro just has the word you know has pro on it so that means like a precursor to an enzyme so thrombin is an enzyme prothrombin is like a precursor 
just like we did with O-G-E-N. Like I said, when you put O-G-E-N at the end of a word, it means it's like a precursor. The other way to do it is to put pro in front. So instead of saying thrombinogen, they don't use that word. They just put prothrombin. So prothrombinase converts prothrombin into thrombin. So you have prothrombin in you right now, but you don't have thrombin. So once the prothrombinase converts the prothrombin into thrombin, thrombin, as I'm writing here, thrombin is going to turn around and convert fibrinogen, which is one of your plasma proteins. It converts fibrinogen into fibrin. So it's a little confusing. You've got like two um, – you've got – did I write it? Oh, I did. I hate when I do that. There. I do that all the time. So prothrombinase converts prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin is going to turn around and convert fibrinogen or fibrinogen to fibrin. It's like uh, it's like taking – like before you not, uh, launch a nuclear missile, you take like two keys and – both people put it in and you turn it at the same time. It's like one of those deals because when you throw a clot, that's what you're doing. It's like your body's version of launching a missile, right? So you don't want to make clots unless you absolutely have to. So um, it's a common thing for people to make clots when they're not supposed to. So, um, you know, that could get stuck in different places in your body that you don't want to get stuck. Like it could get stuck in your lungs. It could get stuck in your head and that would suck. So, um, plasmin is the protein that dissolves fibrin. Pretty much it's really, really, really difficult to dissolve these fibrin or fibrin thread threads once you make them. So when you, uh, people that get strokes, they'll give them, depending, they'll give them um, fibrinolytics, right? And that's, it's, it's pretty much versions of, um, of plasmin to like bust the, the clot up. But that's what's happened with, with a lot of people that get um, strokes. You know, they, they got to, um... yeah, and by the way, if anyone has anything to add at any time, jump in. You're always welcome. This is never about me just talking. Um, all right. So coagulation, a.k.a. clotting, does that seem okay? Any questions? Good. No, we're almost done with blood then. Um, once we do the next chapter on the heart, then I'm going to ask you, what's the difference between a, getting a blood clot in your legs? Like they talk about DVTs, deep vein thrombosis and, uh, like, okay, what happens if it's in your legs versus maybe, uh, some other part of your body or where could it go? Where could that DVT, where could it go and what damage like could it do? But we're going to do the heart first and the blood vessels. So then we could like follow it along and see where those blood clots could potentially end up. This is the last uh, part of the blood chapter, um, just blood types. And um, so all of our cells, as we're going to talk about when we get to the immune system, they have uh, special molecules on it that identify those cells as belonging to you only. So they're very special. And um, any cell that doesn't have that name tag saying like this cell belongs to Klaus. You know, if I, if I have a cell that comes to the party without the name tag with my name on it, my body's going to attack it. The exception is your blood cells. Um, it's a little more broad, right? So there's, there's not particular name tags for every person, right? There's, there's two different name tags. There's an A name tag, a B, or you could be wearing two name tags, or you could have no name tag. So these are, these are proteins, right? So it's, it's an A, 
antigen, a B. You could have both antigens on your blood, or you could have none of them on your blood. So there's different um, implications to that, right? So if you're type A blood, it means you have this type A antigen on it. So if you're, you know, who can you give blood to? Who can you receive blood from? Well, you can obviously get type A, so type A and type A. And same thing with B. If you're type A and type B, you can get blood from either. It's not, so you, it, it, what it is is that you're introducing something foreign to the body. That's the problem. So if you're type AB and you get type B blood, well, you're not getting A. That's fine. It's fine because there's, no, there's nothing foreign showing up. Like you have B, you got B, the A is missing. It's not a big deal. Type O doesn't have anything on it. So that's why I put here universal donor. So if you give type O to anyone, there, there's nothing strange on there that they're going to recognize. I haven't talked about the positive and the negative thing yet. Right now, I'm just doing the A and the B. So type O can give to anyone because you're not introducing something new. There's nothing on here, so there's nothing to introduce. But if you're type O blood, it sucks to be you. You can't get any of these three because you're introducing something new. Type O gets blood only from type O. But it's a great blood donor, right? And if you're type AB, you can get blood from anybody. But I didn't throw on this the RH factor, right? So there's another protein that's on our blood, and we call it RH. And either you have it or you don't have it. If you have it, you're positive. If you don't have it, you're negative. So negative can always donate to positive because negatives don't have anything. So you're not introducing something new. For example, A negative can donate to A positive because the A negative doesn't have it. So you're not introducing something. But you can't go from positive to negative. So A positive cannot donate to A negative. So if we were to like go over this again, the absolute best recipient, the universal recipient would be AB positive. They can get absolutely anybody's blood. Because no in under any scenario, you're not you're not introducing anything new. And the absolute best donor and worst person to be in a car accident, O negative. You have nothing on your blood. You have no proteins. You can give your blood to anybody. But the only people that you can get blood from are O negative. Like that's it. Right? Because under any other scenario, you have something. Um, you have a protein on your blood cells. Does anyone have any questions on that? my pause to drink all right you seem to get it okay have i been on mute this whole time no okay all right, all right you can hear me okay i'm gonna keep going so that's pretty much blood let me just go through this again and and i'm gonna go over some stuff that i oh i'm sorry one last thing uh, um Hemolysis, um, they call it um, hemolytic disease of the newborn. So this is why some of you have, might have gotten um, Rogan. So what happens is that <clears throat> in some situations, the mother's negative, A, A minus, B minus, A, B minus, O minus, whatever. You're negative for the RH. The father's positive. So... So you have A negative and, you're, and the father's B positive. So 50-50 shot, the baby's going to be positive. So now you have a baby that has positive blood. You have negative blood. If you don't catch that, that baby will be fine. 
But when that baby, when you give birth to that baby, now there's exposure. Now you've been exposed to foreign blood. You're negative, that baby's positive. So now on the, as you're giving birth, you're exposed to that baby. And so now you start making antibodies against that um, against that, that blood. So the first baby's fine, but the second baby, if that were to happen again, then the mother would attack the um, the fetus. So I would end up in um, a miscarriage, unless right. We have drugs now, so now if you're if you're, I, I'm not sure. Like I think hospitals are all different. I'm sure if any of you could speak to this, but I'm I'm sure that now they just give it to negative mothers. I don't even think they test the father anymore. Does anybody know? I think they give it like even before they come in for delivery because they they used to do it. You know when they were in labor and stuff like that, but I don't see them giving it anymore. And I think they actually given it earlier, which I, you know, I'm not real sure. There must be new research about it. You think it would be like automatic or do, or do you think they just give it? For yeah, those conditions where, you know, mother's negative, father's positive, And they, I don't know how they know if the baby's, I don't know how they test for the baby to be positive, you know, but yeah, yeah you know, I don't know how, because it used to be that it was when they came in that you would do that. And it was kind of like temporary antibodies. Like the body, it, it attaches to and it gives, it fools the body to think that it's got like, a, it, it, like it has antibodies and it's already made it. So it doesn't make it. Your body doesn't make it. And then you pee oh, it yeah. and then it's gone. And Is uh, it Rogam? Yeah, the Rogam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They still using the Rogam. All right. Um, yeah, so that's that's what that is. Um, so, all right, so what would I like you to know from this chapter? Well, everything we already went over. So I would like you to know um, generally how clots are made, just the fact that <clears throat> um, that the blood cells, they change their – when they're exposed to something like collagen fibers, they change their their shape and their behavior. And those three chemicals, ADP, thromboxane A2, those work to activate the other platelets. They make them sticky and they activate them. Thromboxane A2 is also a vasoconstrictor and serotonin is a vasoconstrictor. So I'd like you to know that. I'd like you to know this slide here. Um, and then the AB, you know, what's the universal donor? What would be the universal recipient? And what is um, hemolytic disease of the newborn? So that's kind of all we covered from those, from, from the rest of this chapter. <clears throat> So I will post this and I'm going to open up the next one. 641. I'll keep this one up. All right. All right. So now we're moving on to the heart. Definitely, definitely need to know the heart. In my opinion, inside and out, you should know it. Um, <clears throat> Because it's, uh, it's important. So before we even start with the heart, we have to figure out what its purpose is, right? And so um, you're breathing. So we're going to go to breathing. Why do we even bother breathing? Well, um, we're breathing in oxygen. We're breathing out carbon dioxide. So some people think it's all about breathing in oxygen, and that's what's driving breathing. Um, there's different opinions. I think more people believe what I believe in that it's CO2, the, your desire to expel CO2, that's what drives respiration. You're breathing because you want to get rid of carbon dioxide. So, um, you know, your cells are making ATP, you're eating food and you're making ATP and you need to get rid of that extra carbon. So if you think about the difference between oxygen and carbon dioxide, 
oxygen is O2, carbon dioxide, CO2. So the difference between those two is what? C. It goes in as O2, it goes out as O2 with a C on it, CO2. So you're getting rid, you're you're getting carbon out of your body. So um, there is a constant exchange going on between your lungs and all of your cells. And by all of your cells, I mean like tissues, right? Because because tissues are just groups of cells. So there's an exchange between your lungs and cells. Oxygen comes into your lungs. Then we're going to take that oxygen to all of your cells. At the cells, we're going to pick up carbon dioxide and bring that back to the lungs. So oxygen from the lungs to the cells, carbon dioxide from the cells to the lungs. Like that, back and forth, back and forth. The heart is in the middle. The heart is the middleman, the mediator. So what the heart's doing is staying right in the middle and it's saying to the lungs, okay, lungs, give me the oxygen, the oxygenated blood. I'm going to take that oxygen and deliver it to all the cells. And then it goes to the cells and the, and the heart says to the cells, okay, cells, give me back the carbon dioxide. I'll give it to the lungs. And when the lungs give me oxygen, I'll bring it back to you, right? So the, the heart's kind of in the middle here. So um, the heart's essentially a muscle, right? And of course, it's pumping. It's the thing that's pumping all of this. We have to get the, how do we get the oxygen from the lungs to all of your cells? Well, we got to pump the blood, right? So the heart's doing it. And how do we get the carbon dioxide out of the cells and back to the lungs so that we can breathe it out? The heart's pumping it, so it's just a pump. The heart is a pump, so it's really no more than that. It's a pump. It's just a mus muscular pump. It's a big mass of muscle. It pumps, and it's the middleman, right? So, and so that leads to another thing. As you look at this picture, you see that there's like purple here, or in lots of books, it'll be blue, and then um, there's red because you have two different types of blood in your body you have body you have blood that has a lot of oxygen you have blood that has not so much oxygen in it and so um most of the time they color it red and blue although purple is more accurate actually um and by the way i stole this from webmd right before class <clears throat> so um you have oxygenated blood and you have deoxygenated blood a more accurate term would be oxygen rich and oxygen poor blood. I always use oxygenated and deoxygenated, but technically deoxygenated blood has um, some oxygen in it, just not a lot, right? So if I were looking at like my, like my hand, right? I've got blood vessels coming out of my heart, going around my shoulder, down my arm, and giving oxygen to my hand, right? So that's going through like arteries, right? I've got arteries going around my shoulder, down my arm, to my hand. I've got veins going in the opposite direction, right? That's delivering carbon dioxide. So I've got like two roads going opposite ways. So, um, yeah. So now we're at the heart. <clears throat> so where does the heart come into play? So the heart is kind of difficult to figure out if you haven't seen it before, but um, I have a feeling that Mr. Waddell taught you the heart. Did he? I'm hoping he did, even though he shouldn't have. Yes, he made us uh, get up in front of everybody and say hi. First in the class, I didn't do it. <laughs> Probably what he's not supposed to do, but I'm so glad he did it. <laughs> um, so you already have an idea about the right atrium, the left atrium. Um, then I'll go over it quick. Right, the heart is divided in half. You have the right side and the left side. Remember, when you, we look at these things, it's anatomical position. So it's a it's like a person facing you. So the left and the right are reversed. Right. So you have the right side. And you have the left side. The left side only deals with oxygenated blood, and the right side only deals with 
deoxygenated blood. They don't mix like once you're born. They don't, there's no mixture in the sides. Then we could divide the heart like this, up and down, right? So the top is the atria. That's the receiving department. They receive the blood. And then the bottom is the ventricles. They send the blood out. So if we look at our four chambers, right atrium receives blood from somewhere. You can say it to yourself. Receives blood from somewhere. It's deoxygenated blood, so it must be coming from all your cells, all your tissues. Then it's going to hand it off to the right ventricle. And the right ventricle is going to ship it off. It doesn't have any oxygen, so where does it have to go? It's got to go to the lungs. So we follow this through, and you notice that it's going both directions, like that. So this is going to the left lung. This is going, this one goes behind here, and here it is. It's going to the right lung. So it's kind of going both directions. <clears throat> so that's blood going out to the lungs. By the way, we call these, this is called a what? A pulmonary, don't say vein. I hope you all said artery. Artery, <laughs> yes. It's an artery because an artery is not about what type of blood it has in it. It's about the direction that the blood's going. So an artery is going away from the heart. A vein is going toward the heart. So in this case, this is pretty much the only exception. These are reversed. The pulmonary arteries have deoxygenated blood. The pulmonary veins, the blood coming back, that has oxygenated blood. They're, they aren't showing the pulmonary veins here. But the pulmonary veins come into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and the left ventricle is going to send it through the body. All right, I'm glad you guys know that. Um, if you forgot it, just kind of go over the blood flow through the heart. Um, and we're going to talk about the valves in a minute. And um, there's some good videos on it. Um, again, like Crash Course makes a good video. Khan Academy makes a couple of really good videos on the blood flow through the heart. So Khan Academy, if you want to look up some other videos on it. This is the wall of the heart. This is the wall of the heart. The, the bulk, the bulk of the heart is called the myocardium. See, it's right here. So this is just this, just this big part right here. That's the heart. This right here is the pericardium. This is a covering around the heart. But this is the heart right here. So you see this red part, and there's a white line right here. And I got my pointer on it. And there's another white line outside here. I got my pointer on it. So you have myocardium. The inside of, the, of it is called the endocardium. So if I were to take my finger and stick it into like an atrium or a ventricle, I would be like touching the, the endocardium. If I were to grab a heart, I would be touching the epicardium. Like if you just pick a heart up, you would be holding on to an epicardium. That's the outside of the heart. Of course, before you can access the heart, there's like a sack around the heart, and you have to cut the sack away and move it, and then there's the heart. All right, and so then you pull the sack away, you grab it, that would be the epicardium. It's just a very small layer. The bulk of the heart, the muscle, is the myocardium. Endocardium is like the inner lining. So, yeah, the whole thing is surrounded with a pericardium. I'm not going to go into like the different layers, but it's surrounded by a sac and then there's fluid, right? So a lot of our body is set up that way. So you have the organ and then you have a sac around it. And then there's um, ah, like this. You have the organ, you have a sac around it, and then you have fluid in there like in between. So it's kind of like the heart's kind of floating in a fluid. 
So pericardium. You'll hear that word because some people get an inflamed pericardium, pericarditis, right? So if that gets all inflamed, then the heart, like the heart's beating, but it's got like that sac is inflamed. So it's kind of constricting the heart from beating. Um, endocarditis, that'd be the endocardium getting inflamed. That's another thing that can happen. Um, okay, so we're looking at the outside of the heart here. Um, so some of these big vessels, the um, vena cava, here's the one down here, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. Those are both going into the right side of the heart the right atrium. This is an oracle, by the way. I don't know if he told you what it does. It's just like a little sack that can fill up with some blood. And um, it's just a way, if you get extra blood in the atrium, that sack will expand a little bit. But anyway, um, atrium. All right, so anyway, here's the vena cava. Here's the pulmonary trunk. So this is coming out of the right um, ventricle. So it goes in here, blood goes in here, vena cava, right atrium. Now follow the arrow, right ventricle, out through the pulmonary trunk, and here's the pulmonary artery. And here's the other one. Here are the pulmonary veins coming back. So pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins. Remember, with here, with the pulmonary, it's reversed. Right, the veins are, this time they're red. Um, oh, and then, so it goes into the left atrium, through the left ventricle, out through the something valve, aortic valve, and there's the aorta. The aorta just kind of comes up here and drops down behind the heart. There's the aorta right there. And then you see some blood vessels coming out of the top. Right, this one is going to go, this one's going to split. If you follow this one, it's going to be a carotid artery up the neck and a subclavian around the shoulder. Clavian for, you know, clavicle, right? So, and then here, this one is just going right up the neck, right? Carotid artery goes up the neck. Subclavian goes around the shoulder. And then this one drops behind the aorta, and as it keeps going down, there's a bunch of blood vessels that like branch off of it. Um, how are we with time? I don't know. Does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna go like five more minutes. Did you guys, did, let me ask you this. Did any of you, not were any of you not in Mr. Waddell's class last semester? That's a good place to start. Send a chat. Put like, tell me in the chat if you were um, not in his class. Okay. Um, so I'm going to assume all of you had like something, at least like a basic. Blood goes here, then here, then here. He probably made you memorize like a list, right atrium, whatever, tricuspid, right? Okay. Um, let me go for the valves then. So four chambers, right? Two atrium, two ventricles, four valves. These are AV valves, atrial ventricular. They're in between the atrium and ventricle. Right, and they operate, they're, they're, they're one-way doors, right? If you look at, if you look at, um, if you look at my door, it opens in to the room, right? But if I try to go out this way, it closes it. That's how the valve works. And, um, so what happens is all the blood tries to flow in back up into the ventri into the atrium. It's like all the blood, it's like everyone trying to leave this room and we all shove up against that door and it doesn't open that way. It only opens in. Right, so that's how the valves are set up in our 
in our body. There's actually another way to look at it too. The reason this door doesn't go into the hallway, obviously is because of the door jam, right? But imagine that, um, imagine that there was like cables, right? One end of the cable is here, and I'm gonna take the other cable, and I'm gonna attach it to the wall here. So there's a bunch of cables that I have attached here, right? So when I open the door, the cables are gonna like sag. And then when I close the door, the reason that the door won't keep going is because those cables are preventing me from making it swing into the hallway. I don't know if that makes any sense. So really that door would swing both ways, like a door in a restaurant kitchen, except there's a bunch of cables that are attached to the wall and keeping that door from swinging too far. That's what, that's what the AV valves have. So they're right here. See like those, those white strings right here, they're called cordae tendenii. They're preventing, so people think that they open the valve. It's, that's not what they do. They keep this valve only going in one direction. They keep it from swinging back into the atrium. So when this valve is open and the blood's going like that way, I moved the thing. When it's when the when the blood's going this way, these are all loose. When the blood tries to go back up, no, it closes the door and these cords, cordae tendenii, these cords are tight. So these cords are preventing this valve from swinging the opposite way because you only want blood moving one way. We don't want blood to go back into the atrium because, well, it needs to leave. It needs to leave the, um, the ventricle. So it's, it's inefficient to send any of that blood back. But sometimes it happens, right? So if you remember, this is the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve, but we call it mitral. Um, this one will sometimes prolapse sometimes go into the atrium a little bit, or it doesn't work quite like it should. So it'll be like a mitral valve prolapse. You'll have a little bit of blood go into the, um, back into the atrium again, which is what you don't want. So, but anyway, this is an AV valve. That's an AV valve. This is a semilunar valve. These are semilunar valves. This one is the pulmonary valve. This one's the aorta valve. Nobody calls it the pulmonary semilunar valve. They just call it pulmonary valve. So um, tricuspid, pulmonary, aortic, mitral. If I want to talk about the two valves together, I just say the AV valves. And you know I'm talking about the ones between the atrium and the ventricle. Or if I say your semilunar valves, that's talking about the valves leaving the ventricle, leaving the heart. So for example, I'll say, oh, well, the heart sounds that you hear when you hear like a stethoscope, the first one's your AV valves closing and the blood's hitting up against them. The second sound is the semilunar valves closing and the blood's hitting up against them. So like the blood gets ejected from this ventricle, it goes out. Then the heart relaxes and the blood tries to go back in and it closes that. So I'm talking about these two valves here because I say semilunar, these two valves, atrial, ventricular. All right. I went a lot faster through that um, than I normally do. You can watch this video again. I might make another video myself just with some basics about the heart. Or even better yet, I might just link to some people that do it much better to Khan Academy or something like that. I'll show you a couple of videos. On uh, Wednesday, Wednesday at 10, I'm going to start going over physiology. As of right now, I've done mostly um, anatomy. Um, it is, isn't it? And that dude's from, um, I think he went to Grace King. I uh, forgot his name. Sal, Sal something. Yeah, he's from Metairie, 
public school. So um, public schools can work. It's not the school, it's the person. Now that my kids are older, I spent a lot of time stress. Yeah, see, with the, those of you with young kids, stop stressing about school, school, school. That's something that was imposed on us. First of all, to I'm talking to you from an outsider, but I think to keep. All right, whatever I'm not gonna say. It. You know what it is, but anyway, there's no reason that I mean, it's the pain. If, if you're on your kid's ass, then they're going to do all right. You know, what is it about these magnet schools? It's all the magnet school parents. It's all helicopter parents. So when the teacher calls one of those parents and says, oh, we don't think that little Harrison was acting all great today, those parents whip Harrison's ass. Well, they don't. They give him a long, long time out, though. And so um, that's what you got to do with your kids. I don't know about the time out part, but you know what I'm saying? Like, they react. Right. Whereas other parents, they'll be like, no, not my kid. No, you, you, you know, so it's, yeah, don't stress about those schools. Man. Public schools can, you know, it's, it's whatever school. What are they doing in school anyway? Right. Nothing. So it's all about the parents. Sorry. It's not a topic. Where, uh, I'm a firm believer a good student will do good anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to go any place special, you know. You if you wanna you wanna learn, you're gonna you're gonna love. I I mean I have two daughters that are complete opposites. One I never did anything with her and she just excelled. You know, she just always did her stuff. And the other one I had to do everything with. And I finally at fifth fifth grade I said, You're on your own. <laughs> you know, because if, if they don't learn when they're young, they're gonna always depend on you. You know, so I think yeah. you know, it's their work and it's their grade. So they gotta learn that at a young age. Just got to keep on, you know, get your homework done <laughs> or you don't get to go do this. <laughs> well, I don't feel like it was like I used to think that the schools made the kids. But then I think, well, no, they took all these kids like nowadays. I think they took all these kids that were going to perform well anywhere and they shoved them all in one school. So, you know, those kids would have done. They would have made a Khan Academy no matter what school they went to. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, I did. I spoke about a proctor. Um, the next, the the subsequent exams, probably in all of your classes, are going to be proctored, which means um, the bad part is if you were looking things up on the internet or you were reading your notes, you're not going to necessarily, you're not going to have those notes available to you now. Um, the good news is there's no time. Well, I'm going to put, it's going to be like two hours or three hours or whatever. I don't even care about the time. So you're going to have all the time you want. I'm going to give you a really good idea about the questions, but you're going to have to, no, you're not. You're not. And I'll tell you why you're not going to fail because I'm going to tell you, I'm, I, I'm setting you up with the questions. It just depends on if you guys have time to study it. So, um, you know, short answer, um, you'll do much better than multiple choice, much better because it leaves you room. And I'll be like, look, I'm going to ask you this question or this question. Here's eight questions. I'm going to ask you five of them. You prepare all those questions. You could even send it to me beforehand. Um, so like a study guide, no, but. Yes, because I'm telling you, like I went over the the blood the blood thing, and I'm like, okay, you got to know this slide and this slide, and I can even tell you what the questions are, um, and you can you can write them out, and you could t ask me, like send them over. Hey, are these good questions? And I'll be like, yeah, that's good, or I'll tell you fix this, fix this, and then all you got to do is learn that, and you know, so it takes some work on your part. But you'll also know what's going to be on the um, on the test. The bad part is that you need, if you've been trying to take this on your phone, which you shouldn't have, you're going to need to use a computer. Um, maybe a tab tablet might work. I don't know. Yeah, don't get freaked out though. Um, still on our computer, everything's still the same. It's just that um, 
your camera's gonna be on and you're not gonna be able to click off and you shouldn't have been going to other websites anyway, but I already know some of you did. So you shouldn't have been doing that anyway. But um, it's just like, it, it's, look, it's the same thing as if you were to come to class. If you came to class, I'd give you a test on paper. You would write the answers out, turn the test in. This is the exact same thing, except that in class you would have about 30 or 40 minutes. Now you have as much time as you need, just that you have to recall it from your head. I'll be a little bit easier on spelling, but let me look at the questions. Oh, let me stop sharing first. Um, hold on a second. Stop presenting. Let me look at the questions. Um, now you guys will, you guys will be fine. Um, I'd be happy to do a um, like further study sessions. Like let's say we do Wednesday's class. If you guys want to do a study session on like Thursday or Friday, we could. I got no problem doing that. Um, I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. So um, we could do that. You guys know what it is. It's just the fact that I'm saying Proctor is making you nervous. Just like it would make me nervous. Yeah, we can do it. Um, we'll plan some time on Wednesday to 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 do a um, like a study session or something. That would be that would be fine, and we could do it earlier in the day. So um, yeah, don't freak out now. I'm just giving you a heads up. It's supposed to go into effect this Friday for all your classes. Um, don't freak out. You'll you know it's just but. Study today. Study today, study tomorrow, study Wednesday, and you'll you'll be relaxed by Friday. And like I'm saying, don't like you don't have to don't cram two hours on Friday. It doesn't work. Just do 20, 30 minutes. If you can find that time, then you'll be fine. Does anyone have any questions? All right, let me stop recording. This is probably like way too long as it is. Um, Essay questions? No, I, I have no problem with multiple choice. I, you, I know typically you guys feel better about multiple choice, but um, I'm telling you guys, you don't, you, you don't do as well on them. I've been making them kind of easy, but you know they can get really hard. Whereas 